Hello, my name is Mert, and I'm from Turkey. A couple years ago, we started an organization called Design for America, and I'm really stoked to be back here. So last year, for those of you who weren't up here, Dr. Liz Gerber, the faculty founder of Design for America, she was up on this very stage to tell the story of Design for America. And she invited me to come here and talk about my experience while I was still a student in Design for America, studying in the McCormick School of Engineering at Northwestern University. Two years ago, DFA was just a dream for me. And today is my job. I graduated from Northwestern, now I work full-time in Design for America. And the dream, when it turns into a job, I guess that's what you call a dream job. <laughs> so, when I first heard about Design for America, the hair on my arm stood up. You know, I want to start off by telling you the story of what gave me that feeling. This is the story of how I fell in love with design. This is the story of my first Design for America project. Four friends, Yuri, Hannah, Casey, and me, all in our first two years of college, we you know, participated in this thing called the Summer Studio at Northwestern University in Design for America, and this was the question that we were trying to answer. How do we get rid of hospital-acquired infections? For those of you who are not aware of this problem, this might sound ridiculous to you, but every year, 100,000 people die due to the stuff they get inside of a hospital. Now, just take that number in. Not a lot of things kill 100,000 people every year. But we took this challenge on, started working with North Shore University Health Systems. This is a hospital literally five blocks away from our campus. We got into the hospital, started observing the doctors, ideating with them, interviewing them, brainstorming, building little prototypes, most of which doctors and nurses wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> But at the end of six weeks, we came up with something that excited a lot of people in the hospital. And as of last year, I really couldn't talk about this because we, we had signed non-disclosure agreements and everything. But today, here it is. The solution to hospital-acquired infections, by the way, is actually quite simple. You have to get people to wash their hands. Again, this sounds simple and stupid. But the average hospital does this about 40% of the time as much as they should. So, you can think, wow, well, that's kind of ridiculous. What's so hard about hand washing? Well, you have to realize that hand washing isn't this singular moment. You have to wash your hands at least five times with each patient visit. So you have to wash it as you go into the room, after you touch the patient, after you input data, after you leave the room. So it becomes complex really, really fast. So basically what we had to do was make hand washing super easy and super convenient for healthcare providers. Imagine yourself, five years old, building a sandcastle. Not, not that one, but something similar, you have your friends, life is great, you get up and you have sand on your hands. What would be the first thing you do to get the sand off your hands? You would wipe them on your pants, right? Healthcare providers do this all the time, just like we all do. This is such an instinctive behavior, it's really hard to unlearn. They're told not to do this, but it's, it's just like anyone, any of us, they, you know, you would do this here, here and there. So we took this hand hygiene motion, and designed it right into the heart of our system. This is what we came up with. This is one of our earlier prototypes, and it clips onto your scrubs just like this, and it uses this instinctive hand hygiene motion to dispense the hand sanitizer gel. And we can then go on to add simple electronics and tracking devices for this so we can actually measure if people are washing their hands or not. This excited a lot of people, and me and Yuri, we're still working on this project. We're actually moving forward with piloting this technology with two of the major hospitals in Chicago, and hopefully you'll go to a hospital and see a swipe sense, we call these things swipe senses, you'll see a swipe sense right in the corner. Actually, I hope you won't go to a hospital anytime soon, but if you do, you'll see a swipe sense. Now, that's an exciting story, right? And I love telling the story, but for me, the product, swipe sense, is almost the, the front end of this project, of this, of this story. What really excites me about this whole experience in my summer of my sophomore year, I mean, I started off by looking at this huge problem. I mean, hand washing has been around for more than 150 years. Dr. Samwise, this was the guy who discovered that, yeah, it's my, I think this is a good idea if we wash our hands while we're taking care of our patients. You know, a lot of people thought about this idea. Who were we to take on a challenge of this magnitude? But through Design for America, I found awesome people that I love to hang out with, not just design things together, but hang out, actually. Found incredible mentorship, people who guided us through this whole thing called design, and a deliberate process of creativity that got us to that idea. So I got into the summer thinking, what the hell are we going to do? And I left by asking myself, well, is there anything we can't do? And that 
in a nutshell, is what happens in Design for America every day. We're a nationwide network of student net design studios creating social impact through local projects. We started off in Northwestern University about two and a half years ago, but now we're in a total of eight universities. We're in University of Oregon, we're in UCLA, we're in Stanford, we're in Dartmouth, we're in Brown University, we're in Columbia and Barnard, and we're in Cornell University. The Cornell University that made it to the cover of Fast Company this month. But our goal isn't just to stop at eight studios. We want to be in all 50 states in five years with more than 50 studios. Some of the most passionate and innovative students, as we speak, are designing real solutions for real problems across the country. So as we grew as an organization, really the scope of the projects that we took on grew as well. I'm going to tell you one that happened last summer at Northwestern Summer Studio. Meet Hannah, Tristan, Jenny, Oliver, and Jeremy. They partner with an awesome organization from Chicago called the Inspiration Corporation. They're an incredible nonprofit. They work with the homeless population living in Chicago. So the team was researching what they could work on, you know, homelessness. This is a big problem. How do we take this on? As they were researching, you know, the general stuff about homelessness, this is what they landed on. A homeless person, on average, walks about 36 miles a day. That's a lot of walking. This is Jenny, one of the first people they interviewed. And for Jenny, walking isn't just a means of getting from place A to place B. It's the way that she gets her livelihood. She starts off by getting the food from the food bank, sleeping at the homeless shelter, making it to her next job interview. Now, for Jenny, walking is the way she gets out of homelessness. So not only that they have to walk, homeless folks have to walk this much, they're actually the target of a host of different food ailments. It starts off with corns, bunions, but then it goes on to things like athlete's foot and fungi. The team decided they had to do something. They took on this question, we're going to help Jenny, and we're going to improve foot care for the homeless. They start off, just like any designer would, by going to homeless shelters and interviewing the homeless people, learning really what life was like as a homeless person. So they took on this information, and they started to come up with some insights. And this one struck them the most. In homeless shelters, upwards of 80 people use the same shower every day. And the nonprofits that ran those shelters, they only have the resources to clean them once, maybe twice a day. So even if Jenny, she has her athlete's foot cured, the next day when she takes a shower, she's right back where she started. They took this insight and they started to come up with some ideas. They come up with 150 or so ideas, most of which were crap, and some were okay, and some actually made sense. They built lots of prototypes, and one of them actually worked. It's kind of like a recyclable shower mat, and it works like the examination table covers you would see in, in doctor's offices. You know, you go into the doctor's office, there's a new cover waiting for you. So it works the same way. There's, you pick up the shower mat, throw it on the floor, and you take a shower on that, and then you throw it back into the recycling bin. But the team didn't just stop here. They imprinted these shower mats with the stuff that the homeless folks should be on the lookout for. So every time you take a shower, you actually check out your feet, and it's kind of like a checkup for your feet. So that's, that's a neat idea. But they didn't stop here neither. They actually went on and realized that foot infections is actually a big problem, not just happening in homeless shelters. You know, they happen in gyms, pools, showers, college dorms. Yeah, what they're working on right now is providing these shower mats for you know, the, all of these other entities, which then subsidize the cost for the Inspiration Corporation. But why stop at the Inspiration Corporation, right? Why not make this available for all of the homeless shelters in America? So this might not be getting Jenny a job, but it just might be the reason she makes it to her next job interview. Now, obviously this team isn't done yet. They've started off the project in August 2011. It's only been two months. But that's what they're working on. You know, homelessness is a big problem. But for them, it's just another design challenge. So this is the story of a project that's two months old. You know, obviously it's not done yet. They need to work out the environmental kinks. We don't want shower mats, you know, bajillion of shower mats going into the, the landfills every year. Perhaps it's not even going to end up being a shower mat. They're going to fail. But that's a good thing. That's what they're working on. So implementation is a huge part of the Design for America process. Ideas that remain on post-it notes, as great as they are and as inspiring as it is to talk about them, they never change anyone's life. So implementation is just as important in Design for America as brainstorming or prototyping or observation is. We take that on and embrace it as part of the design, design process. Implementation, more often than, than not, as we realize this, 
is goes hand in hand with the word entrepreneurship. Implementation is really entrepreneurship in designer's clothes. It's just it's a fancy word for it. So I've told you the story of a project that's two months old, only a baby. Now I'm going to talk about a story that's it's a little bit over two years old. Every year, 15,000 children are diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And life is hard, really hard if you're diagnosed with diabetes. You're injected with insulin every day. Your finger is pricked to check for glucose level. You go on and count every single carb you put into your mouth and adjust your medication accordingly. And you're only six. Life gets kind of complex really fast. And as time goes on, the relationship between the parents and the children grow increasingly difficult as well. I mean, just picture this for me. You're a mom. You look down on your kid and say, you know, I have to hurt your finger, but I love you. I want to help you. Your kid looks up and says, Mom, I hate you. You hurt my finger every day. So the team decided to take on this challenge. How do we improve life for families living with juvenile diabetes? And to tell you what Design for America came up with, I'm actually ha I'm gonna have Aaron, the project lead on the juvenile diabetes project, come up on stage and tell you the story of what we came up with. So let's get a big round of applause for Aaron J. Horowitz. My name is uh, Aaron Horowitz, and I'm currently a senior in the McCormick School of Engineering. Um, and what I have in this case is our solution. This is Jerry the Bear. Jerry is an interactive teaching toy for children diagnosed with diabetes. <laughs> By simply playing with Jerry, children learn how to practice their own medical procedures, feed themselves a healthy diet, and interact with medical devices that they would need to on a day-to-day -day basis. He's having a good time. <laughs> Zooming out, Jerry bridges the empathy gap that's generated in between parent and child. Now, to go back a little bit, during my junior year of college, we started out with a sketch. It's an idea. And we didn't just want to let it sit on this post-it note. We, we knew that we had to take this and get it into the hands of children like Lily. I didn't know the first thing about robotics, integrated circuits, soldering, wiring, mechatronics. I didn't even know what the word mechatronics meant. Uh, and so in order to start, in order to take this and get it in the hands of kids, we decided to take a class, a class with Professor Michael Peshkin in mechatronics. And I quickly realized it was where I was spending 90% of my time and getting 100% of my enjoyment. And the next quarter, it wasn't, just, it wasn't just one class, it was two. One of which was with Dan Brown, professor of IP research. And what we quickly realized was that this was not just a project that we were working on on the side. This was a business. And the next quarter, I couldn't see just taking one or two classes on the side that went towards Jerry. Why couldn't all of my classes have that same type of purpose, that same type of meaning? So I did what just about one student a year does in the McCormick School of Engineering. I created my own major. And it has quite possibly the longest title you've ever heard. It's, it's basically, basically called Mechatronics and User Interaction Design. What that boils down to basically is how people interact with, how people play with robots. So here I am. I'm at the end of my junior year, going into the summer of my senior year, and I apply for and receive a fellowship from the Dell Social Innovation Competition, giving me awesome mentors and a little bit of seed funding to get things started. <laughs> there was just one thing I had to do before I got my hands dirty and started building that second prototype. So let me just sort of break down the dates of, of how things went down after, after I left uh, Northwestern. So June 10th, I leave Northwestern, get back to my home in New York, June 12th, I order all of the parts that, at the time, I thought I needed to build Jerry. Uh, June 13th, I had hip surgery. And on June 15th, I sat down at my dining room table, and I began building the second prototype of Jerry from the ground up. Now, four months later, I stand here before you with a completed second prototype, a filed provisional patent, interest from some major toy companies, new mentors, a new business plan, and not to mention, I got a new hip. So thank you guys so much. And he's only a senior in college. Now, I've told you about what our individual students, like Aaron, what they're working towards, what their design challenges are. But why am I here in front of you today? What is Design for America working towards? What is our design challenge? I'll tell you what, the average student today graduates with thousands of dollars in debt 
a piece of paper that says congratulations and no idea what they want to do for the rest of their lives. And this is a serious problem, right? It's a serious problem that millions of bright and brilliant individuals can come to college with awesome dreams and aspirations, stuff that makes amazing college application essays and leave reluctant, unconfident, and worst of all, willing to settle for whatever they can get leaving behind the awesome stories of how they can change the world. Now, I'm not going to stand here and say, well, the university sucks, so we should get rid of it. That's sort of the easy way out. Without the university as we know it today, none of Design for America, none of the projects I've talked about would be possible. There are experts everywhere, you know, professors with awesome research topics. There are tons of students with ample time on their hands, hungry for this kind of work. So, I can't stand in front of you and say, well, Design for America is going to fix higher education once and for all. You know, it's going to take a little bit more than Design for America. I can't stand in front of you and say, every student is going to find their purpose in life and excel at it just by doing a few cool design projects on the side. But this is what I'm going to claim. In Design for America, students take on some of the biggest, messiest challenges we face as a society. Things that cause tons of environmental damage. Things that make life unbearable for countless others. Things that kill thousands of people. But th these students who go through the Design for America experience, as they do, as they come up with answers for these big and messy questions, as they devise those answers, they live by asking themselves, is there anything we can't do? And that's a feeling we're going to have for the rest of our lives. Training students as designers give them incredible power to face ambiguity, face complexity, and face uncertainty, all characteristics of not just design projects, but life in general. In students leave Design for America, they leave college with the power not just to design products or businesses, but the power to design their own futures and take on any challenge, no matter how big. We're building Design for America and mentoring the others who are coming behind us. There are literally hundreds more following our footsteps. I mean, picture a tap. Me and Yuri are literally the first two drops to come out of it. We're the two official college graduates to come out of Design for America. There's a flood of innovators and social entrepreneurs who are following our footsteps. Now, before I finish, I want to thank the amazing design professionals who volunteered their time to make sure that these projects come to fruition, incredible professors who mentor our studios, but most of all, I want to thank the amazing leaders in Design for America, from UCLA to Dartmouth, from Stanford to Cornell. These students are generating the next generation of creative activists, each of them asking themselves, is there anything we can't do? So, when I first heard about Design for America, the hair on my arm stood up. If yours do as well, I know that you'll figure out a way to reach us. Design for America is happening now, and the tap is on for us moving forward. Thank you very much.